everyone and good morning from me. I'm Robert Spencer. I'm the Global Head of ESG Advisory at AECOM and I'm also Chair of the Environmental Industries Commission Nature and Biodiversity Task Force. So you have joined, uh, uh, whether you realise or not, ACE's In Conversation With meeting uh, 2022 series. Um, I'm delighted to welcome our guest speaker today, Lawrence Lewis-Jones. Welcome, Lawrence. Lawrence is the Principal Environment Advisor and Head of Biodiversity at National Highways. Lawrence has over 10 years experience as an environmental advisor, policy advisor, ecologist and researcher, and he's led diverse teams with a range of specialties to support, to support development of environmental policies and legislation, importantly, including the Environment Act and its accompanying secondary legislation. He's developed, delivered, monitored and evaluated strategies for government policies and initiatives and provided technical environmental advice, including on environmental impact assessments, habitats regulations assessments and environmental appraisals to NSIPs or nationally significant infrastructure projects. Lawrence has himself also conducted environmental surveys, undertaken innovative environmental research and trialed novel techniques to measure environmental value and ecosystem services, something which we'll be digging into deeply today. So um, what we're going to do is give Lawrence the floor to present um, on National Highway's own journey to deliver against their challenging corporate targets on biodiversity no net loss and biodiversity net gain, and how they're improving management of the soft estate um, through the use of data systems. So what I intend to do is let Lawrence have a clear run at his presentation, get through his content, which is really interesting, and then we'll break off for questions, which I will moderate. I'll be monitoring the chat um, and we'll pick out some. And I've also got some questions that I want to ask. So I will use the chair's prerogative uh, occasionally to get in those if, if they're not surfacing from the audience. But I think we're looking forward to a really interesting hour here with Lawrence. I'm certainly uh, keen to hear what's what's happening at uh, National Highways at the moment on this. So, Lawrence, the floor is yours. And you're welcome to begin your presentation. Lovely. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Robert, and thank, thanks for that wonderful intro. Um, so we'll just uh, put the presentation up now, and I'll, as, as Robert said, I'll, I'll, I'll take you through it, and then we'll go for some, uh, some questions at the end. Lovely. Thanks, Desi. Should be, uh, should be presenting in a second. Lovely. Okay, dokie. So as Robert says, I'll, I'll just take you through a little bit of, um, obviously a, a lot of people will, will understand who we are and what we are, but I'll, I'll get everyone onto that, that page to start off with and then, then talk about, um, as Robert said, uh, where we're going. So National Highways, as was National uh, Highways England, as was uh, the Highways Agency, we, we, we love a name change, um, is the owner operator of the strategic road networks, all the large, all the large roads in England. Um, you'll see from this slide that we have lots of different things all around our network. We've got lots of sensors, lots of signs, we've got lots of bridges, but importantly for this talk, we've got 30,000 hectares of soft estate that verges either side of our, our network. Um, to put that into perspective, I believe that's about the size of the Isle of Wight, which you can see at the bottom of that map there. Next slide, please, Desi. So at National Highways, we're at that, that point of our, our sort of investment cycle of our roads period where we start thinking strategy again. Um, so we'll soon be publishing our environmental sustainability strategy. And these are some lines um, taken from, from that upcoming strategy. Um, we're going for a bit of a step change in the, in the company um, for, for our next sort of funding period where environment is higher up the agenda than it's ever been. So our tagline for the strategy is a connected country. Of course, we need, we need to connect. We need, we need roads that run, people can get from A to B, but we also need a thriving environment. So I won't take you through all, all of the lines on, on this slide. The slides will, will be shared afterwards for you to read. But the headlines from this are supporting healthy, vibrant and sustainable economies. Um, understanding that the economy, livelihoods and well-being of, of everyone in, in England and especially around our SRN depend on, on, on the natural, natural environment. And as the large landowner of the natural environment, we have a responsibility to maintain and enhance that. We also 
look to deliver not only connecting the country, but have a moral and economic duty to protect and enhance the environment. Um, our network obviously connects a lot of businesses and has a large economic impact, but it has a large environmental impact. And that, that's that step change that we're really pushing for now to understand that and to be a better custodian of the environment that we own. Next slide, please, Dizzy. <clears throat> so we, we have lots of outcomes that, that we look for in, in the environment. And since 2015, since we became a government owned company as Highways England as was, um, the main factors that we've been focusing on are reducing noise, alleviating flooding, protecting biodiversity, reducing air pollution, and producing alternative routes for uh, non-motorized users, so walkers, cyclists, horse riders, etc. We'll continue on all of those topics, but the next slide that I'll show you is, is, is a step change in, in how we're thinking about these. We're moving away from necessarily a topic-by-topic -topic viewpoint to an outcome-led system. So within our up and coming uh, environmental sustainability strategy, uh, as you can see our big tagline in the middle, connected country, thriving environment, we have three main pillars that we'll be concentrating on. One is nature, which is what we'll largely be focusing on today. The other is carbon, rightly so. And uh, we're, we've, we've had many talks, many talks on that. I think Robert has also joined us for some talks on carbon in the past. Um, and the, the third pillar is communities. And what falls under communities is taking care of the local communities, but also taking care of the health of the local communities. So uh, our different forms of pollution that can happen near our network, the air quality, um, the noise, focusing on continuing to focus on those. You'll see on the outside of this, this circle is our outcome areas. Um, these can be a mix of the different topics. Some of them are, are, are quite clear. Mitigating pollution is, is, is largely air quality, noise, and runoff. Um, but we've also got some that are, are, are wider objectives, managing the land for its environmental value, integrating the land with its wider landscape. A lot of different topics form in part of that. Um, something else that we're, we're very keen to be pushing forward is, is of course, nature-based nature, nature -based solutions. Um, and as I said, the slides will go up, so feel free to re read the rest of them. And, and I'm sure there's other outcomes that, that, that different people uh, prioritize in, in, in there. Next slide, please, Lizzie. Okay, so one of the main points that we're going to be talking through today is our biodiversity no net loss and net gain commitments. So you can see from there, these are our these are our sort of key performance indicators and our commitments going forward as a company. We started off um, looking to reduce the loss in our biodiversity when we were first a government owned company as Highways England in 2015. So up to 2020, we looked to reduce our loss in, in biodiversity. We're currently in road period two, which is 2020 to 2025, and our key performance indicator in this, this road period is to get to neutrality of biodiversity, so no net loss of biodiversity. From the end of this road period, 2025 to 2040, we'll be exploring net gain in biodiversity. <clears throat> Obviously, these are just titles, and there's a lot of work within the company to understand what that means for our company and how we split up these targets to the different parts of our, of our company. Not only do we have to work out what these targets actually mean and deliver them, but we do have some quite large challenges that are ahead of us and some that are behind us and some that are continuing. And um, the main challenges that we have as a company to delivering these commitments are firstly trying to keep up with developing policies um, and metrics. I think we've all seen the developing biodiversity net gain policy coming out, coming out of DEFRA. Um, which we largely support in, in national highways. We, we use their metrics and, and, and conform to the policies, um, but they change quite often. And for a, for a, a large developer like us and, and large landowner, um, it takes time for us to, to develop those, those metrics and get them in, into the business. So that's one of the largest commit, uh, challenges that we have. We also have cha challenges in, in setting ambitious but achievable targets. As I sort of alluded to when I was talking about how our targets are going on through our road periods, we need to we have to work out what that actually means for a company. We we have we have quite a split down the middle of our company of the, the developer side, so our major projects, and the landowner side, our operations. And we need to be able to set targets that, that are challenging and push our business in, in the right direction, but are also achievable so that they don't frustrate any uh, the other parts of our business. Um, as I said, it's the, it's about a connected country and a thriving environment, um, not one alone. 
we won't continue to be to be the company that we are and work on on the license that we've been given from government if we don't manage to hit both of those. Um, the other challenge that we have is forecasting and financing. This is linked to, to the, the targets above, but because we work on such long five year periods and we also develop projects that take a long time to design and to go into construction, forecasting their impacts and making sure that they can achieve some of these very challenging targets is, is, is definitely a challenge in itself. Um, once we forecast, we can then understand how much it will cost to Im potentially improve what we're doing. So that forecasting and financing is, is vital to us, us hitting these targets. The fourth challenge that we have is upskilling and embedding. Um, as I said, these policies develop relatively speedily um, in, in terms of the timescales that our company works at. Um, so we have to work hard to make sure that our company understands them, um, that we upskill all areas of our company, especially the, the, the delivery sides, to make sure that we understand what's expected of us and we can deliver against that. Um, and the final main challenge that we have is managing competing objectives. So as I said, we need to have a connected country. We, we need to uh, give the primary benefit that our network gives, which is connecting, connecting people, but also achieving uh, our aspirations in the environmental uh, sphere. Next slide, please, Desi. So this is a, a very quick slide about, about what we do to, to deliver no net loss and net gains of, of, of biodiversity. Um, I would ignore the figures in this because this is a slide that I, I've previously used and the figures have all changed, but it, it's, it's basically showing how we, how we really just use the mitigation hierarchy to, as our delivery hierarchy against our uh, biodiversity aspirations. So you, you can see we start off with a, with a baseline environment Generally, we have, we have some sort of construction on, on that, be that um, a maintenance uh, regime or a major project, building a new road, um, enhancing an existing road, widening it, changing a junction. There is always going to be some level of construction on, on our network. So obviously the first thing that we look at is to try and reduce the harm that that, that, that construction is doing, reduce the loss. Um, once, we, once we've, uh, reduce the loss as far as possible. We then obviously look to provide additional, additional planting, enhancing habitats, improving habitats um, on our network. So on, on the large 30,000 hectares asset that we have. And then finally, if we can't fully address our biodiversity loss and gains on site, we look to uh, work with partners off site to deliver others. And then we go into an establishment and, and, and maintenance period where we have to ensure that all of the habitats that we put in on our network and that we've worked with others to develop um, have, have time, have, have funding and have resource put to them to establish and then maintain. Next slide, please, Dizzy. Okay, so I, I mentioned the fact that we, we look to do enhancements on our network and off our network. Um, it probably won't be news to, to many on the call that one of the biggest levers that we have and the, and the biggest mechanisms for delivering the enhancements on site and off site is our biodiversity fund, which falls under the umbrella of National Highways designated funds, which is a ring fenced pot of money to spend enhancing beyond business as usual. Um, with our current uh, designated fund, we use uh, Natural England metric 2.0. Um, to deliver biodiversity unit enhancements that can be either part of a major project, part of operations um, to help them reach their targets, or sometimes they're, they're entirely, entirely separate schemes. Um, these schemes contribute to us meeting our national target of no net loss in this period. Um, as I said, they, they compensate for regional operation assumed losses as well as major projects. Um, and it's some of the some of the heaviest hitters in this fund are stakeholder partnership projects, which I'll go into some in detail later. Next slide, please, Desi. So this is a, a little segment of some of the um, designated funds guidance that, that we have out, out there in our guidance document. Um, I won't go through too much of this. Largely, this is this is to be read read out afterwards, but it shows what we're looking to to partners to deliver. Um, for the funding that, that we're providing. So we, we very much work hand in hand with, with our delivery partners, um, be that 
uh, the Wildlife Trust, National Trust, RSPB, local landowners, anyone is free to apply to this fund. Um, and we look for biodiversity units back from, from our funding, um, be that through an increase in the distinctiveness or distinction, uh, distinctiveness, uh, sorry, condition or distinctiveness of, our, of any existing habitats or the planting of new habitats. Uh, next slide, please, Dizzy. So within our biodiversity designated fund, we have um, some criteria to meet to, to have a good project that gets funded. So what makes a good project? Um, it has to have quality of quality for money for us. Um, that means, in short, the amount of biodiversity units that we can claim for the money. But it also has to reach a, no, uh, a number of other criteria. So we have to be sure that this, this habitat can be delivered, that it's maintainable in the current maintenance systems that we have within national highways or the maintenance systems that the landowners that we're working with use. It has to be more than just numbers. So although the first criteria is that we need to know the amount of units we're getting for, for the, the cash that we're providing, that's not the only thing that we focus on. Um, we have to make sure that we're applying metrics correctly. Um, sometimes these metrics can be gained. Um, as they develop, their, their ability to be gained will, will, will reduce, but we have to make sure that we're planting the right thing in the right area so it actually works. Um, and the, the final thing that, that make, makes a good project is having some strong agreements with landowners. So we work, we've, we've worked with many different landowners, um, some of which are very used to maintaining habitats and improving habitats, some of which this may be the first time. So we have a range of different agreements that we enter in with our, with our uh, partners to make sure that they have the ability to deliver what they think that they can deliver and that we have an ability to make sure that that's happening going forward. Next slide, please, Desi. So that was what makes a good project. What makes a great project is higher yields, lots of biodiversity units. Um, we've been working with um, our internal partners and external partners to provide guidance on the type of habitats that we have on our network, where, where is best to enhance, um, where we get the most points for, but also what's most fitting for our network. So there's a few examples that we have here. Sometimes some scrub creation on a low distinctiveness habitat um, can work really well on our network. Um, species rich grassland on low nutrient soil is something that we've really actively pursued. Um, we've worked with partners like Plant Life to produce guidance on um, species rich grassland and how to um, remove nutrient levels from soil to, to make sure that we get the species rich grassland that we need. Um, we also look particularly when we're looking at offsite, as we don't have very much arable land on our network, as you might guess, um, we, we look to create uh, some, some absolutely fantastic habitats on arable land, as we get a lot of, we get a lot, a lot of points from that. And obviously it, it has a great benefit for um, the UK's biodiversity. We also look for, to added value from some of our projects. So whilst connectivity isn't an intrinsic part of the biodiversity metrics at the moment from, from DEFRA and Natural England. We obviously have a great opportunity as a landowner, a large uh, longitudinal estate, a large linear estate, and we have a great opportunity to connect habitats. Um, so we really look for that in, in some of our projects that are being delivered. We also look for wider environmental um, benefits um, to people, climate resilience, carbon sequestration, um, whether or not we're having a landscape function. We have lots of funds that are all for these different topics and we can, we can pull different amounts out of each pot and, and, and look for projects that really help across the board and don't just frustrate any of our other aims, but actually work together to, to deliver better whole environmental outcomes rather than just biodiversity in, in itself. We also look to partners to provide match funding where, where possible. These projects always get, get through very well um, because we can do so much more when, when others are funding as well, producing very, very large areas of habitat sometimes when we have match funding. Next slide, please, Denny. So I've got a couple of examples of some good projects that were well, probably great projects actually by, by the last slide. Some great projects that we've been delivering using this biodiversity fund. 
Um, so the first one is a project that's linked to a, a major project down in Cornwall, which is the major project is the A30 Carland to Chiverton Cross. Um, it's an area of, of, of road network that, as you can probably guess by it being Cornwall, has some quite seasonal challenges to it. Um, it's one of the only areas of the A30 that isn't currently jewelled. Um, so this scheme was looking to, to use both the existing network and to go off network to provide a dual carriageway to link, link up uh, Carland and Chiverton. As part of the main scheme, um, there, were, there were some large bids that went into the biodiversity fund to not only do what is business as usual, the good environmental work that the A30 scheme, its core scheme itself was doing, but to improve further than that. So they've looked to increase woodland and hedgerow cover, deliver large numbers of biodiversity units and biodiversity net gain. Um, they've also looked to use this funding to go above and beyond the business as usual scheme to mitigate and compensate for the scheme earlier on. Uh, this, 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 is, this is an additional benefit because of the, the time it takes for obviously for habitats to, de to develop. Where we can mitigate and compensate before we've even made the damage is obviously the, the, the gold standard that we, that we like to work to for um, protecting biodiversity. Um, we, we have um, within this scheme a lot of added benefits that aren't just the units. So this is one of the sort of demonstrations of where we, we, where we look to go above and beyond. It's not just a calculator. So you can see these, these green ribs on, on, on the screen, these green areas are to connect the habitats across our network. They all include either um, protected areas or species rich areas, uh, existing areas, and look to connect, connect those across the estate. Um, the project also has an adaptation to climate change um, requirement built within it, and this goes beyond that to make sure that we're delivering the habitats that, that can adapt to the changing conditions especially the, the, weather, the weather events that we get down in that part of, the, the, of South West England. It's also improved pollinator habitat. As I said, you know, one, of, one of the things that we really look for is, um, is some high value pollinator um, species rich uh, meadows and grasslands. Um, this is really targeted that, so uh, they should be delivering really large scale pollinator habitats. And it also enhances the local character. Um, so for, for landscape benefits. Uh, next example, please, Desi. So the previous example was where we worked with major projects, um, did stuff that included um, on our estate and off our estate to, include, uh, to improve connectivity and others. This is an example that we have where it's largely off of our network, um, but uh, working with wildlife trusts to increase the UK's or England's biodiversity as, as a whole. So this is the Network for Nature. It's, it's a large program uh, scale uh, improvement that we're, that we're working, as I say, with the Wildlife Trust on. Um, it's a program of projects to create, restore, and connect places for wildlife where the environment has been impacted by historic road building or maintenance activities. So it's these, these sites are largely in some way connected to our network, um, whether that be that they've had uh, poor drainage and runoff historically going into them, or if they've had potential um, nitrogen pollution, or they've been, um, they've been disconnected by previous road building. Um, yeah, largely it's habitats that have, have been struggling, and one of the parts of why they've been struggling has been to do with their proximity to the road network. It includes lots of different habitat types, as you would expect from a, a, program, a program of enhancement. So we've got woodland in there, we've got grassland, wetland projects, we've even got a green bridge trial in there. Um, and it's a, it's a program uh, worth about six million pounds um, with additional projects being brought, brought forward. So the six million pound is our first phase of working with the wildlife trusts. Um, they were probably the, lar the, the first large landowner that we, that we worked with in this road period to deliver this program led, led approach. Um, we're working with others now as well. And we're also looking at um, other tranches with the wildlife trusts. But this first tranche has 26 projects in total, um, looking to improve around 690 hectares of habitat. So it, it's, it's quite, quite a large program and, and there's more to come. Uh, next slide, please, Desi. So that was, that was what we use our environment funds for, to, to try and hit our, our very stretching target of no net loss of biodiversity in this current funding period. Um, 
our business as usual practices also need to change for us to, to really deliver well against this, this objective and to move into our next road period on a solid footing so that we can really hit the ground running on, on, on delivering against not only biodiversity, but our other environmental aims. So all of those outcome areas that, that, that we showed you in that, that wheel at the beginning of this presentation. So this, this slide is to talk about what is our soft estate and how do we use it and how can we use it? So our, our soft estate, the verges that surround the, the 30,000 hectares of land that, that we own, is, is a finite area. It, it is, it's, it's large, it's 30,000 hectares, but it, it's, it's only that. Um, and it's used for a variety of different reasons, for access, safety, and running of the network. Uh, it has competing priorities. Um, we, we not only need to get biodiversity out of this, but as I said, we've got, we've got broader environmental objectives and outcomes that, that we need our soft estate to help us to achieve. So that could be biodiversity, carbon, tree planting, renewable energy generation is, is an area which we're starting to consider as a business and um, small scale generation and storage. And um, any, any, any landowner has an ability to, to help out um, in our, our current energy, uh, I don't want to say crisis, but energy crisis. Um, and it's about, for us, it's about balancing those, those priorities. The opportunity is that it's, it, it is a large area. It's, it's unfarmed. It's, it's probably one of the largest um, land holdings that, that doesn't have um, farming as, as, as a priority, um, apart from potentially uh, the MOD. Um, and our habitat can sometimes be untouched. We obviously have maintenance regimes for cutting. We, you know, we, 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 can, we can cut our meadows, we can thin our woodlands, um, we can cut cut things to so that we have visibility for signs and the workers can work on our, on our network. But there are large areas which are reasonably untouched. And so we have some quite interesting species. We have some, some, some interesting species of, of orchid and, and, and other plants that, that you don't generally see everywhere because it can be untouched, our network. As I mentioned, it, we have a long linear network um, which can provide habitat uh, corridors and it can connect fragmented habitats into the wider landscape. Um, it obviously has an ability to fragment habitats as well, and that's why we explore other opportunities to connect transversely. But we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't forget the ability to connect in a, in a longitudinal linear way, which we, we really have, have the opportunity to, to deliver. Uh, next slide, please, Diddy. Perfect. Um, so this what this next slide is talking a bit about where we want our soft estate to go, what, what we want to do with it. And the main change is, and I know that you know, we've we've had things like uh, many, many landowners and many people with large operational assets always say, data will save us, data will save us. Well, we're saying data, data will save us. Um, we need to, to get better at measuring, measuring our, our asset. Um, so this is a step change that we're looking looking to enact for our next road period, um, so that we can prioritise management of the soft estate. If we there's that there's that old saying I think by by a, a, a 20th century economist, if you can if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, and we want to measure it better so we can manage it better. Um, so we'll use our our better environmental data, which will mean sometimes more surveys. A lot of it will rely on um, remote sensing and better, better environmental uh, data packages that can integrate the knowledge and the data that we have segmented around our business in, into one large usable uh, data package. We'll use this to track our operational performance, our biodiversity net, no net loss, net gain commitments, amongst many other environmental aspects of our, of our network. Next slide, please, Desi. Oh, perfect. And now we're on to the Q&A section. So I'll, uh, I'll hand back to Robert to, to sort of lead this, but yeah, happy to answer any and all questions. And uh, pleased to say, Lawrence, that uh, we have got some, some good questions coming through already. So uh, we will we'll get to those folks. Um, there's a couple that I wanted to ask as well, but we've got a good half an hour. So uh, I think we'll get through Quite a few, and uh, we'll be we'll be uh, en enjoying your your responses, Lawrence. So, the first one I had was, and it does relate actually to I think a question from Isabel earlier on. So we'll we'll, we'll bring her question in too. Um, working on the verges of our road network can be inherently dangerous and expensive. Um, 
some people ask, should we be investing in nature on these areas of land versus other areas of land that don't carry that, that risk and that, that risk to health and safety? How do you think about that within the strategic road network and your objectives and targets? Yeah, it's, it, it, is, it is a point that, that, that we, that we can, can be asked. It, it can be expensive to deliver on our network. Our network does offer a lot of potential. So as I was sort of previously saying, the long, it, firstly, we're a very large landowner and we shouldn't be letting uh, habitats of that scale um, go, go to the right and ruin. But we also have this ability to connect habitats. Obviously, in a sort of post Lawson re review world, we have a big and connected uh, area, area of habitats. We, we should look to make them better. Um, it can be expensive, it can be unsafe, and that's where we look to our, our prioritization systems. So we've been working with partners to map out our estate in a much better way. We've been working with uh, Manchester Metropolitan University, which, which some, some people may have seen we did a bit of a news flash on in, in May, to understand largely from remote sensing where the areas of, of real potential are in our network, um, whether that be that it's in a disconnected habitat or they're low quality habitats that can be enhanced. So we really want to, to get to a point where we can really prioritise interventions so that we're not going out just maintaining the, the whole asset in exactly the same way. But we're prioritising and understanding that those places may be quite expensive, but there's a real value in doing what we're doing there. Um, so for us, it, it's, about, it's about balancing that, um, the, the safety, the, the, the cost, the other, the other competing priorities but to make, make sure that where we are doing something, we're having a real, real measurable improvement. And for us, that's, that's worth it. When it is such a large habitat, it's worth doing something like that. Um, we don't forget that we can deliver um, some other habitats offsite um, more cost effectively and in a safer way. And that's why we use things like the, like the biodiversity fund to, to make sure that we're connecting not only our network, but we're working with local landowners close to the network and sometimes further away from the network. So that we're part of a sort of stepping stone, a heterogeneity of, of, of habitat and an improved England uh, biodiversity, not just ourselves. But I think, and I, you know, I, I, I may be biased in this, there's, there's a lot of value in, in delivering on a, on a network that can connect most of the country, not only through cars, but through nature. As you said, and you, you know, your points around uh, connectivity and, and networks along the linear estate were, were very well made and, you know, obviously with um, with climate change adaptation uh, being a, an issue, you know, spare a thought for, for, the, for the wildlife as well that needs to sort of adapt. You know, those networks actually can be extremely helpful for, for migrating uh, plants. Yeah, it's a, really, it's a really good point. It's, it's, it's a strange world where, where we may see, see wildlife migrating up, up the A1, but uh, yeah, it, it may be happening. It, it may do. Um, one more question from me, and then I'll, I'll dig into the, the excellent questions and comments that are coming in from the, uh, the audience. Uh, you just actually mentioned funding, and it, it's clear from what you were saying in your slides that the, the designated funds are going to be pretty integral to achieving your biodiversity commitments for the road period 2025. So we've got uh, you know, just, just over two and a half years left on that. What, what will happen in the next um, road period, and, and how can you... Um, you know, be sure that you're going to have some continuity in terms of the level of commitment to these biodiversity uh, projects and programs. Yeah, so the designated funds were, have always been set up to go above business as usual. So they've been a really good way to push our business to do better. Obviously, um, at the start of, of, of our period, so 2015 for the start of road period one and 2020 for road period two, we weren't in the, the strong position that we're in now. We didn't, we weren't, we weren't generally delivering the type of large landscape scale habitat improvements that, that we are now. So we've really utilized these designated funds to push, push business as usual to get better. Within the next road period, <clears throat> we, there should be uh, an amount of designated funds to keep pushing that envelope. But what we'll be doing is building a lot of the good work that we've done in this road period through designated funds into our business as usual contra uh, contracts for the next road period. We've used this fund to find out what works and to, to upskill and, and, and really push that envelope. And now we're in a good position to start building that back into business as usual, making sure that uh, all of our projects and operational areas are appropriately funded to achieve the goals that we achieved in, in this period through business as usual funding. So we can then use the designated funds 
however much they they, they may be in, in the next rate period to push further. So they're always they're always about leading and then we'll follow with our contracts. Yeah, yeah, I can see. So you've got a sort of almost a, a double go at it with the, the designated fund, but then also integrating into your schemes as well. Yeah, exactly. Just a couple of questions here that I'm going to sort of uh, bring together. There's one from Luke Casey and one from uh, Terry Wilkinson. They're both asking about similar sorts of things, connectivity solutions, green bridges, underpasses, fencing, mm -hmm. culverts, uh, that kind of thing, which obviously we, we know well will all reduce habitat fragmentation. Luke asks the fact that the defrometric doesn't value these benefits. Um, Terry asks how you're considering ongoing maintenance for these kind of connectivity solutions. So kind of a double whammy there, but I wanted to bring those two together because they're covering some of the same uh, asset uh, queries. Yeah, so it's a good point about the biodiversity metric not 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 having it in it. Um, and it, it, it shows why we're not just looking at the numbers of, of the metrics. We have we have a very strong push to get the numbers right. Um, it, the, the metric is, is a good start to, to know the, the environmental harm and enhancements that, that are possible with your schemes and with your maintenance. But it's not the only thing we look at. So we do have um, we do have obligations to to increase our, our connectivity, especially in, in, our, in our standard major projects through through planning and EIA. We have to we have to include them. But we also have a historic asset that hasn't always been the, the best for it. So this is an area that we're actively looking to pursue um, in our next rate period. Um, and you'll see when our environmental sustainability strategy is published, one of one of the outcome areas is to increase that, that connectivity. Um, we haven't named it Green Bridges, um, but it, it's Green Bridges are part of it, alongside you know, better fencing. Um, underpasses, direct, directing wildlife to use, use these crossing structures. It's a really good point. I'm, I've been blabbing on quite a lot about linear connectivity and obviously one of our major downsides can be this transverse connectivity. Yeah. So it's really that we're, that we're, that we're going to push for for the next time. Um, we'll also continue to suggest to, to DEFRA Group that the connectivity is, is included in future uh, metrics. I can understand why, it, why the decision was taken to, to remove it from, from the current uh, metrics as there wasn't a fantastic tool at measuring it, um, it and it didn't have as much value as it probably should do in the metric so I think they've taken that away and they're going to basically do it properly next time so we definitely welcome that coming into the metric but we don't you know our, our company isn't just isn't just driven by that that single number thanks I'm going to again bring a couple of themes together um We've got Biff, Biff Hulston and uh, Amrit goes talking about similar sorts of things. Amrit's mentioning water and drainage targets around biodiversity opportunities for lagoons, river bridges. Biff's asking about maintaining and restoring connectivity of water resources. Again, obviously, there is an intersection with, with your network, with some of these key uh, riverine canal and other water ecosystems. It's, is that something that you've been looking at as well, Lawrence? Yeah, it is. So broadly, as, as, as a company we, and, and as an environmental division, we, it's certainly something that, that, we, that we really value. We, we have a current designated fund um, for, for water quality and, 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 um, and, and flooding. Um, and part of that does include the connectivity of the rivers and streams that, that, go, that go through, through our, our network. It's also something that will be much better picked up in terms of its interaction with biodiversity as we move to a more outcome led rather than a thematic topic specific uh, way of funding and way of uh, pro providing our, our, our objectives for, for environment. So it's definitely something that, that we'd like to improve. Um, in the water space, we're obviously looking at uh, many, many other points, not, not just um, culverts and connectivity, but we're actively exploring in this current very period, um, natural flood uh, mitigation. Um, and that will, will, will have in itself some, some biodiversity value that, that we're also learn, uh, starting to learn how, how to count NFM with biodiversity units. Um, obviously, there are other biodiversity metrics that we will begin to start using more and more. So currently, we only generally for our, our KPI use the, the habitats um, hectareage area metric. Um, we still record the, the river Rhine uh, units and the hedgerow units. Those, um, 
And it's something that we'll certainly be pushing more and more in our next road period to start using um, the, the river units as well, which does recognise connectivity within it. That's, that's fantastic. Really interesting to, to see the focus on that. Um, I'll go back to one of your, your slides now. You were talking uh, to some extent about the NSIPs, uh, the Nationally Significant Infrastructure Projects. Now, they're required to achieve biodiversity net gain from 2025. Does that shift the goalposts for you as well in terms of national highways as commitments? Or is it more of the same for you? You're already in that space with your own existing corporate objectives. Yeah, so we have a variety of different objectives, as, as you say, for the different parts of our business. So some of our larger major project schemes are already delivering well and above of, of, of 10% 10, 10 net, net gain. Um, we definitely recognize that as, a, as, as, as legislation and we will definitely be delivering against any NSIP legislation, um, which will likely come in in 2025 for, as you say, for, for, the, for the 10% biodiversity net gain. That doesn't change what, what we're doing as a company. What we're doing as a company is, is to make sure that we manage the asset in an appropriate way and that we're a good custodian for biodiversity. So we'll see as, as, we, as we go on our journey to, to biodiversity net gain, we'll see different parts of the business performing in different ways. So it makes sense, as, as we have done, for our larger schemes to lead the way on that. <clears throat> Mostly their NSIPs anyway. So we were already in the sphere where, where most of our NSIPs are delivering biodiversity net gain. What we need to then focus on is bringing our other schemes up to a, a, a neutral level so that we can demonstrate neutrality of our asset and biodiversity net gains where, where, we, where we are implementing these large projects. And a follow on for that would be, is it actually easier to achieve net gain with your very large schemes? Um, and and do they in some way actually compensate for perhaps some of the frag more fragmented smaller schemes where it's difficult to perhaps uh, achieve uh, the objectives within the kind of red lines of the, the developments or the improvements yeah definitely and, and it, it's it's one of it's one of the uh, the the um sort of opportunities of being a, a very large landowner and a large developer mm -hmm. that we do have some projects that are intrinsically quite hard to get gains from um, particularly where we're not purchasing any extra land, where we're putting more concrete down on something green. So if we have a, a junction improvement or a small widening scheme, these are certainly restricted, especially in the current sphere where they where they don't have um, biodiversity net gain requirements. So we don't have an ability to use compulsory purchase. And it, it also means that biodiversity net gain can be quite low down the planning balance for these schemes. Um, so we don't have those opportunities to really deliver on, on those schemes. And that's why we kind of, we're looking forward to, to the mandatory requirement, because at least for the biggest, we have a real ability to start um, compulsory purchasing for land where we, where we see it appropriate and making sure that we redesign it in, into the main scheme and have to, as we say, use our designated funds less. But yeah, we will always have some schemes that perform well and some schemes that perform badly. Yeah. And as a company, that's why we, we do use... Um, trading between our schemes that's so that we, we use question. That that interesting. Please, please dig into that a bit on the trading how that, how that works yeah so obviously we, we want to be efficient with the money that we spend and there's no point chucking away millions and millions to a scheme just to get it up by one point when we can put loads in, into other schemes so currently we have a have a neutrality requirement so a no net loss requirement um in our in our in our biz period we have our, our some of our major schemes delivering large large units and some of our our smaller schemes looking to reduce their loss. So they, there is trading that goes on. Um, the trading largely uses the trading principles within um, the metrics. Yeah. So we look for areas that are close together. So if there's two schemes near each other, one's having a loss, one's having a, uh, a gain, we can trade quite easily between those with a reasonably small discount factor. Where we have to, where we have to go miles away in the country, then we have to start using, using the discount factors. So it's, it's relatively consistent with how one would expect, expect us. But it's certainly one of the nuances of using a metric on a large land landowner scale rather than just on single projects. It has its it has its opportunities, but it has its risks as well. Well, that's a lovely segue into Sally Fraser's question. Uh, she asks: Are national highways exploring the use of other metrics beyond the biodiversity metric to measure wider ecosystem services and enhancements? I guess. Yeah, it's a really good question, Sally. Thank you, Sally. Um, yeah, so we've been following the progress of what was the, the Natural England's Ecometric, which is now the Environmental Benefits from Nature tool. Um, obviously, there's lots of other, other tools out there in, in terms of natural capital accounting. Um, but in terms of something that's coming from a consistent position from government, that's, that's one of our, our, best, our best metrics to, 
to track the progress of and, and to see how, how it's utilized. That metric is very much designed to be an add-on to the biodiversity metrics as well. So it's talking in all the same language it uses, the same habitat types um, you can have to, to survey. Um, we have an ability to use that in some of the early stages of our projects. So some projects are already using what was the Ecometric Environmental Benefits from Nature tool um, to influence their, their route selection. Um, it's a really good use of that tool. The tool obviously doesn't necessarily compare apples with apples for all its different environmental services, I'm sorry, um, ecosystem services. You can't say that I've had you know, X amount of noise reduction and that offsets an increase in carbon. But what it can do is it can, it can, it can really start off a conversation around what, what are we prioritizing within in this scheme and which options are, are really delivering what we're prioritizing. So we do have some schemes that have started to use that. We've put that into our appraisal guidance, which is owned by DFT, which is WebTag. Um, so all projects have an ability to use that at the early stages. We'll certainly, we, um, we are still working with, with Natural England to see how that tool develops and understand how we can use it later down the line to actually potentially influence some of our uh, cost benefit analysis and, um, and ratios that we use to fund schemes. Because at the moment, we have a real struggle, as, I, as I'm sure most developers do, that we see the intrinsic value of a lot of, a lot of um, env good environmental outcomes, but we struggle to balance the funding equation with them. Mm. So trying to square that circle is something that we'll be really pushing through through DEFRA Group to, to, to help large landowners and large developers with. Lawrence, thanks. Back, back to designated funds. Question from Mark Wilson here. Will designated fund applications be made easier to access funding for biodiversity net gain projects? And he gives an example. We've recently encountered a situation where retained woodland management within a national highways land holding would be precluded, uh, as this was seen as OD's responsibility. I'm not sure what OD is. Maybe. <coughs> Yeah, so this is the sort of beyond business as usual additionality um, issue that, that, that we can encounter. Um, we have expectations on, on, our, on ourselves as, as, a, as a large landowner to maintain an asset. Um, if that's not happening, then we have to look at why that's not happening and influence our contracts. So that's part of bringing, bringing enhancement into business as usual, but it's also about clearing up some of the mistakes. Well, not mistakes, but environment being partially overlooked. When we when we went into a period of austerity you know 10 15 years ago um, so that should be picked up by a cyclical maintenance if 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 we expect it to be and it's not we find it very hard to use this extra funding to do so because we 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 may be seen to be double paying for that if we're already paying a maintenance provider to do it we can't pay them again to, just because they're not doing it well enough so that may be where, where that project may have fallen down and we'll certainly be looking to, to make sure that maintenance is picked up. Um, as a broader question, making, making it easier to bid for money. Yeah, I think we've learned a lot from the process. And that's one of the reasons why we have it in this ring fence funding. It's to make sure that we, we have an appropriate mechanism for making sure what we're delivering is good. Um, it's, it's what we say we're going to deliver. I think the, 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 there's certainly been frustration in the past that potentially our value for money criteria is, is set too low and it's hard, it's hard to deliver within the costings or we've said we don't think a habitat could actually be delivered there when, when others, when the people bidding think it's almost guaranteed. And so we're definitely, we're working um, with our designated funds colleagues and from my technical biodiversity side to see how we can smooth through this we're definitely learning from the lessons and we've, we've set up a bit of a task force within, within our company to make sure that we're really supporting projects to go through so that we can hit our target by the end of this uh, road period. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Lawrence. Um, sticking with competing priorities, um, clearly you've got your, your no net loss and your biodiversity net gain commitments. I remember earlier on in your presentation, you were saying there are other things that you want to do on the soft estate terms of carbon sequestration, in terms of uh, generating and storing your own energy. What, what kind of sort of um, prioritization or, or balance of benefits approach are you using with, within national highways to sort of make, you know, make the right call there in terms of, is this gonna be a, an area that we really focus on the biodiversity or over here, we're gonna really focus on the energy generation. How are you looking at your sort of land use priorities matrix, I suppose it might be. 
Yeah, so historically we've had a variety of different objectives that, that can be achieved um, within, within our, our network and within our software state. And they haven't necessarily talked to each other as well as they could have done. And we haven't necessarily prioritized. It's been, sometimes it's been a first come first served. If, if the energy team wants to think about generation in a certain area, they almost bookmark that area. And when we go do biodiversity elsewhere, so it has been a bit disjointed and it, it's, as you can expect, it's not the best way to hit our targets. Um, so this is where we're really depending on our new approach to asset management and to asset data. Mm. So we're currently in the process of writing an asset management strategy for the soft estate. It's the first time it would have had one. We've had them historically for, um, for structures, for pavements, et cetera. But this is the first time that we actually have a strategy for the soft estate itself to say what the priorities are. Yeah. This, this strategy will then be intrinsically linked with our new approach to managing the data. So we'll understand what our priorities are and how they fit together, the potential risks that they have for each other and essential opportunities they have to dovetail together. Um, that will set our high level priorities. And from there, the operation side of our business will set the, the detailed targets that they want to do. Once they have those detailed targets, that we'll have a, a system in place by the end of this very period that means that they can say, okay, we need to deliver this much energy and this much carbon sequestration, this much um, noise mitigation, all in this area. Where are the best areas to deliver that? So it, it, in its most basic form, this system will be a whole bunch of different environmental layers that, that tell you the potential for delivering on that area. So for biodiversity, it'll be areas of low biodiversity, condition and distinctiveness that have the ability to become, to become higher. Those will almost be sort of set aside and less as a real priority for the other actions. And the other parts of this will also feed into that. So for energy generation, where is it that we link really closely into an existing network? And we can see where they compete and we can make decisions on that. We can also see the large areas where there's no competition and it's a no-brainer to do the single intervention that helps that single um, outcome. Yeah. yeah. And it sounds like a lot of this uh, new decision making process is is linked to bringing that uh, environmental data under management more effectively that you mentioned as a, as a key priority going forward. Um, I wondered if you could give us a bit more insight on on, on how that's going and, uh, and and what the what the plans are. You mentioned that you're going to be using um, you know, satellite data more effectively and, and backing up with ground truthing. Um, and, it's a lot of area to cover, you know, 30,000 hectares is, is no small, small area. Are you starting with sort of segments? Are you going across region by region? H how are you sort of cutting up the big pie there? Yeah, so, so we start off from a, from a position where there is quite a lot of data available. It's just sitting in disparate systems. Um, because of the way that our contracts have been historically set in our operational areas, a lot of our operational areas have reasonably good sort of GIS type systems where they've recorded the surveys that they've done, the site for maintenance that they've done. But that's never really come into a centralized system. We have a centralized system that isn't as fit for purposes as it could be for, for them. So everyone's kind of split off and done their own data. Yeah. We also have a huge amount of data generation as part of our major projects and, and new roads building. And again, that's, that sits in a very disparate part of the business that's used for for the purpose of getting that scheme well designed, getting it through consent. But it's unlikely that that comes, that all of that data and it's the potential of that data is then realized when it comes back into our central system. Mm. So the first task that we're currently undertaking is to understand where all that data is and how it can fit into our centralized system. As a, as a company, we're moving to a new sort of spatial portal approach where a lot of our data can then be fed in together. So that's as a company what we're doing. As a, as a division, we're then looking for where the holes are and looking for what other data do we need? Does it act, accurately record where a noise barrier is in its condition? Does it accurately really say what the, what the condition changes of that habitat? Does it record a trend in that habitat? Do we know where, where, we're, where we're reducing in biodiversity? We need to pull a lever and do something. None of those things currently happen. So that's the second stage that we're just starting now. Um, and that's the stage that we'll be doing for the next couple of years so that um, when our next road period starts, We'll have an integrated system that can pull that data out and part of that task again will be generation of new data there will be some areas that we need to either survey or um, use remote sensing to, to fill in the gaps and it will go through a large prioritization exercise about a data hierarchy for that as well to make sure that it's usable by by our um our operational partners our major projects and our supply chain 
Yeah, it sounds like that that is a significant data integration, you know, system integration exercise that you're going through. But I think, you know, the results of that would be absolutely incredible in terms of the power of that data system and, and data bank in order to en enlighten, you know, future schemes. Um, you know, I think you'll, you'll really build a powerful library of, of resources there. Yeah, it's, it's always been sort of the holy grail of, of, of us. And, and as I sort of said earlier, any real big asset asset uh, manager is always the holy grail to get better, better environmental data. Mm. We, we have now much larger aspirations in the environment and we're, we're bidding for, for a lot larger funding for our environmental outcomes. And so what was what's the holy grail is now needed to make sure that we, we, can, we can use that investment wisely. Yeah, yeah. And a, a final question from me, because we need to draw to a close now. I've noticed a, a couple of folks have had to, to leave to get ready for their next meetings. Um, how are you doing at, at National Highways on your, your, uh, your targets? What, what's the sort of corporate picture or the national picture looking like right now? Is there, is there any trending that you could give us, uh, Lawrence? Yeah, so as with any of these things in our road periods, we start off very slow. Um, we had the first two years of this, this road period where we delivered very few units against the units that we needed to deliver. Yeah. We, have, we have very stretching targets where we assume a, a loss across our, our, across our operational area um, linked with overall UK decline of biodiversity. That certainly put us in a position where we need to deliver a lot of units. Um, we, we, we made that assumption because we wanted to make it hard on ourselves. We wanted to make sure that we were really delivering biodiversity. Um, but it has meant that we've got a lot of units to deliver against. We're now about halfway through our, uh, just over halfway through our, our road period. Yeah. And now we have a solid program to deliver against that. So all being well, we will hit our target. But we're now in the stage where we're more about managing risks than setting up huge programs. We've done all of that. It's, it's all, we're always going to have quite a sort of hockey stick delivery model towards the middle and, and end, end of our period. Um, but yeah, we're now in a much safer space where we know we've, we've got enough units in our program to reach, reach our target, but we're now trying to work with some of, some of the larger schemes within that to make sure we really bring them through the program and make sure that what we say we're going to deliver, we actually deliver. So we're not out of, we're not out of, out of it yet, but we're, we're certainly, there's a lot more smiles now that we, we have a good program. I bet, I bet. Well, will, will you come back in a couple of years and, and let us know how, how it's all gone? And I think by then some of the, the key figures will have dropped out and, and you'll be able to to share but um yeah certainly i'd be happy to insight on, on how how you're sort of you know moving through starting up right in the middle now and then towards the end of the road period should be uh, should be really interesting to see how the, how the, the units have stacked up yeah I'd, I'd definitely like to do that now people are anxious are they going to be able to see your slides afterwards can you confirm that you'll make them available to ace to share yeah, that's, 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 that's totally fine. There's nothing sensitive, sensitive in these slides. More, more than happy to. Wonderful. That's good. Well, let me conclude then by uh, saying a huge thank you to you, Lawrence. It's been a fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed your presentation and the chance to talk to you in detail about your biodiversity strategy at National Highways. So thanks for taking the time to speak to ACE. You had a good, good turnout. Well over 50 people were on there listening to that and taking notes, no doubt. And uh, more, more will probably listen to the recording afterwards. So it's, I think it's been a really good use of, of your time and our time uh, getting those insights from you. So thanks again. Uh, thank you, everyone who joined. Uh, we hope you found the discussion useful. And uh, if you haven't made it, we hope that you've just enjoyed listening to the recording. Have a good rest of your day and uh, we'll leave it there.